without trying to be cute, how do you know who to ask? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. <laughs> so, if, number one, if you have, for example, a son who's a rav, you could turn to him. You have it easy. <laughs> In general, if let's say, you know, it, 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 it's a very good question. It's a very good question. A lot has to do, you know, it, it would be a chiddush for me to tell you that there is a wide variety of personalities and thinkers. But what I've learned is you, there has to be a match in personality and in philosophy and outlook. In other words, I would agree, I have no doubt that in Mass Sharm there are some great scholars in Toldus Aaron and there are some great scholars, but I know very well that my outlook of the world in Eretz Yisrael is different than theirs. So with all the respect, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for them, I will not ask them a shaila, period, right? That's not, I'm not, it's not gonna work. I have to ask someone that I see eye to eye, that I agree with them. It's not always easy to know, but there is something you sense. You could sense from their attitude. You could sense from even how they interact with people. Right? You know, there are stories about the Chazonish, of uh, people, you know, simple Jews, religious, non-religious, making their way to ask him to get guidance. He would listen to them, right? He would interact with them. You would sense a connection because you sense that there's a complete concern for the welfare of every Jew. An attachment is what is step number one in finding Psaq. It has to be philosophical, it has to be intellectual. And that's what I'm saying, that you, you are in Eretz Yisrael, you've been in shuls, you've been in shtibles. You have, uh, you know, had the merit of experiencing many great people. I have no doubt that you could sense that this is a person I feel comfortable asking the question. And uh, that's, that's how you begin the journey. There are times that we mature. In other words, I know very well that the type of people I would turn to at age 18 are not the people I'm going to turn to at age uh, 38. You know, we change. But it's something that I think you could sense. And um, then you can pray that the, the Almighty guides you in the right direction. Josh. Um, what, um, what did Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Orbach find in the Chazanish's logic that he felt he could uh, say that Hetra Mechir was okay? Okay. So the problem was that the messenger, the messenger, is not, the action is not linked. But the authorities note that if, let's say, I tell a person, I tell a person uh, to go ahead and burn down, I tell you, go burn down that house. But I don't tell you that it's uh, the guy I can't stand. I tell you, I have a house, uh, there's some kind of mold contamination. I am hiring you to burn down the house, and I'm paying you uh, because there's an issue of mold. So you go, not knowing that really it's because I'm the mafia and he's a guy that didn't pay me up, and you burn down his house. They come to you, and you claim that what? I sent you. And I'm going to respond, it is your action. But we all agree that since you were a shogeg, since your, the, the, the negative element, the destructive element of your actions, you didn't do them knowledgeable, correct? So therefore, in such a case, it is linked back to me. So argue, or I think it was Rav Tzvi Pesach Frank argues the following. If I am a farmer, I go to the Rabbanut to do my shlichut, to sell the, the land to the non-Jew. And the Rabbanut follows the authorities who believe that there's no problem of selling land to the non-Jew because, number one, it's not a long-term sale. Uh, next, they are Arabs, they're not really pagan. In other words, that there is no halachic problem. So the Rabbanut, even if you believe that, that it is prohibited, but since the Rabbanut is following a school that says that it is permissible, you could compare them to the messenger who is Shoget. That's a very technical answer that is given to defend or to deflect the concern of the Chazonish. That's what's mentioned. <laughs> And this is, again, this is magnificent uh, discussions and different outlooks, but Chazanish becomes an icon. In other words, he says it, it becomes in some ways like its own religion. And therefore, in Bnei Brak, it's, you can't even think in a different way. In other words, it's, it's, the work of the Chazanish is studied to an, an extent, to an extent that when you take the works of uh, earlier authority of the Rishonim from the 12th and 13th century, 
I've been in yeshiva where there has been an hour discussion analyzing one line. You don't find that done to thinkers of the, among the Achronim. The Chazanishkis, the people that follow the Chazanish, treat the text like a Rishon. And they will analyze it and come up with insight and answers based on a reading of a specific, the way he places a specific word in the context. That's how they're going to go ahead and determine it. It became like a Bible to some of the Chazanish. And that's what happens. It's personalities uh, become more an icon than just a person. So therefore, in some schools, Heter Mechira is not that, Trey for 100%. But post him, and you have people like Roshan Mazal Arbach and others that take a very different approach. Yes, Jack. What do you do with, for example, in the Galil, where many farms that are owned by Gruzim, by Arabs. Right. And they've owned it for hundreds of years. What about the produce from there? Okay. The produce owned by the Druzim in uh, northern Israel or in Umel Fachem, there is no question that you could purchase it from them. But there is a disagreement if the goods purchased from them has the sanctity of Shemitah or not. It was a debate in Tzvat in the 16th century. And there is a debate between Yerushalayim and Bnei Brak. In other words, the philosophy in Yerushalayim is that anything you buy from non-Jews, like Jews or Arabs, does not have the sanctity of Shemitah. That's the Yerushalayim approach. The Bnei Brak approach is, is that it does have sanctity, and therefore, for example, the peels of apples or cucumbers or oranges, since they could be used as animal feed, so therefore you're not allowed to throw them out, and you're supposed to have a, spe a special pach, garbage can, to let it decompose. That's the Bnei Brak approach. Where do you think Bnei Brak got this opinion? Chazanish. That's how it works. In other words, so that's the issue. We, in general, follow the school of Yerushalayim, uh, which is that if you purchase it from Arabs, purchase it from the Druzim, uh, indeed there is no issue of Shemitah, the sanctity does not apply to it. Okay, I thank everyone uh, for coming, for listening. Hopefully we get at least something, a little bit, we're a little bit familiar. God willing, we're having a third one sometime in, in uh, February. February. It's called the European Shemitah. will relate to Prusbul. Prusbul and documents and uh, the release of loans, which is another fascinating topic Absolutely. that relates to Shemitah. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Susan, Michelle, Michelle, and Aliyah.